very warm welcome you're watching world 360 i'm akanksha swaroop explosions and bloodshed is back in gaza because the seven day temporary pause in the israel hamas war has now ended both sides are blaming each other for returning to violence also the u.s attorney for new york has charged indian national nikhil gupta with murder for hire uh, murder for higher charges and the US indictment now alleges a foiled bid to kill Khalistani separatist Gurpatwan Singh Pannu in the United States. But it is the US approach to India that stands out in contrast to Canada's handling of the Niger murder case. We'll tell you all about it, but first up are the headlines. Fighting has resumed in Gaza after the seven-day temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas expired. This is US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has stepped up call for Israel to spare civilians in strongest remarks yet. At COP28, Indian Prime Minister Modi proposes India host climate summit in 2028, launches Green Credit Initiative that focuses on creating carbon sinks through people's participation. In an interview to Associated Press, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the war with Russia is in a new stage with winter expected to complicate fighting after a summer counter-offensive failed due to shortages of weapons and ground forces. President Zelensky fears that the Israel-Hamas war is threatening to overshadow the conflict in Ukraine. And a new book on the British royal family is drawing controversy after a Dutch translation unintentionally named two key royals who allegedly made comments, fearing that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's son would have dark skin. Sounds of gunfire and explosions were heard in northern Gaza on Friday morning within hours of the lapse of a week-old truce between Israel and the Palestinian group Hamas without announcement of any extension. Hamas run health ministry in Gaza has claimed over 100 people were killed in Israeli airstrikes soon after the offensive resumed. Meanwhile, the United States is preparing to impose a visa ban on Israeli settlers involved in violence against Palestinians, this in the occupied West Bank, according to a senior US State Department official. Now, uh, the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has also informed Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that Washington was readying the sanctions and the United Nations has also said that it deeply regrets the resumption of deadly hostilities in Gaza following the end of a truce between Israel and Hamas, calling this entire situation catastrophic. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that Hamas did not agree to release further hostages, infringing on terms of a truce and that Israel remained committed to achieving its objectives as fighting has now resumed. Meanwhile, the New York Times has reported that Israel's military was aware of Hamas's plan to launch an attack on Israeli soil over a year before the devastating October 7 operation that killed hundreds of Israelis. And so more than 100 hostages out of the 240 have been released by Hamas as fighting has now resumed in Gaza. But remember, over 100 hostages are still awaiting their release. What happens to the rest? And what happens to the Gazans who are left behind in this war? And how has Israel navigated the US pressure of extending the pause? I spoke to former Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Rachel Azaria, on these key points. Let's listen in to what she has to say. And in the meantime, the United States, I have to say, is very much in line with Israel. The United States realizes, and we see it time after time, the Biden administration, it's, this is something that's across the aisle, both Democrats and Republicans, they realize that Israel has the right to defend, that we have the right to defend ourselves. Israel has the right, the right to defend herself. This is not something that we can accept. There's no country in the world that would accept what happened in October 7th, that people just came in just, you know, out of, out of the border from another country, just came in and wiped out um, um, villages and took hostages, babies, babies, 10-month-old right. babies, and they're not releasing the hostages. They're releasing some of them. They're also breaking down families. They're releasing part of the part of the family and not releasing other parts of the family, releasing the children without the mothers, even though the agreement was that the mothers and the children are released together. They say they don't know where the mothers are, but that's not true because by what the children say when they come out, they say that the mother was torn apart from the children just the day before. These are so 
These are horrendous things that are happening in our region now. And this is something that we need to realize that the history is changing. It's what has been can't just continue. And this is something that the Biden administration understands very strongly. We need to join forces against ISIS Hamas. No one in the world deserves to be a neighbor of ISIS Hamas or to be governed by ISIS Hamas. What is your reaction, Rachel? What is your reaction when you hear the international community, especially voices from the United Nations or even the WHO, uh, sort of highlighting the plight of the Gazans, of the women there in Gaza, of all those babies who've been left orphaned uh, in those hospitals, uh, and the extent to which Gaza has witnessed that kind of destruction? Who is responsible? Is Hamas alone responsible for, uh, for a destruction that scale? First of all, the hospitals, we all asked them to be evacuated. We made sure that there were safe corridors, that everyone can leave. Whoever wanted to leave northern Gaza, wherever we said that we will have to deal with because that's where the headquarters of Hamas are, we told everyone to leave. We gave two weeks to leave. And whenever anyone wants to leave, we make sure there are safe corridors. And ISIS Hamas, unfortunately, are not, they weren't letting people leave for two weeks. Only when ISIS Hamas started being weaker and they couldn't and they couldn't decide anyone any anymore for everyone, only then did people start going. Fair south, enough. South That's south. one way of looking at yeah. how the bloodshed Wait, has hold on, hold on. The second part regarding hospitals and what you're saying, ISIS Hamas makes its choice to build their headquarters under hospitals. That's what they do. And you have to understand, and I think we all realize that, that the people that live in Gaza, they live under dictatorship of ISIS Hamas. That's the situation. Sure. And we're coming in and we say, and I think this is what the UN should say, and we all should say together, no one in the world deserves to live, be a neighbor mm. of ISIS Hamas, and no one in the world deserves to be under the governance of ISIS, ISIS Hamas. And this is something that we need to work together, and our hands are open we want to work together with the people that live in Gaza to make sure they can build a better future. It will never happen with, when, uh, when ISIS Hamas is governing them. And that's why this is the joint effort that's also done by the United States and also done by many, many big leaders in Europe, such as, such as Germany and Great Britain, and also done by your leader in, um, in India. Right, people absolutely. That understand leaders. And it's a, decade, it's, a decade, it's, a de it's a decades old fight, something that cannot find solutions overnight. But I completely agree with the, with the point which you were making about joining forces. And when we talk about that, we've also seen a sort of parallel propaganda war take place, where we've also seen a lot of sympathy going in favor of Hamas, which should not be the case, which is why I want to know from you, now that uh, Palestinian prisoners are being released, uh, how do you see the impact of that Palestinian prisoner release on the popularity of Hamas in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, where many of these freed Palestinians are now returning? Could this further sort of fuel the ongoing uh, conflict in West Bank? So something interesting that we're seeing is that some of these prisoners don't want to be released by Hamas. Because they say, we don't identify with Hamas. We're not willing to be identified with Hamas. And I think that Hamas is making a big effort to gain more and more power, but the situation is more sophisticated. And that's why the United States, that's why we're working very closely together to make sure that we strengthen the more moderate groups amongst the Palestinian society, and we don't strengthen the more radical groups. Mm. We have to make sure that Hamas doesn't gain anything, and that's why after we make sure that our babies and women and children and, and hostages that were taken from their homes with pajamas to Hamas, to, to, to the Gaza Strip by Aziz Hamas, not people that fought against anyone. They were just, they were just minding their own business. They were people that were, that were having fun in a, in, a, in, a, in a big, you know, nature party. And they were just taken as hostages. We have to make sure they come home. And then we have to make sure that Hamas doesn't have the power, that the radical groups amongst the Palestinians don't have the power to decide and define for the Palestinians that they will live under horror and under, and under terror.
Now, the multi-agency operation to rescue 41 workers trapped inside the Silkiara tunnel in India's Uttarkashi finally succeeded this week. It was on Tuesday evening after 17 days of ups and downs between waves of hope and despair when all of the labourers were safely brought out. In the 15-minute telephonic conversation with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi after being rescued, the workers hailed Prime Minister Modi's leadership in bringing them back. And while Prime Minister appreciated their resilience, he also highlighted the efforts of the rescue team who worked on a mission exemplifying humanity and teamwork. Even as the great Himalayan operation has made international headlines for being one of the greatest rescue operations of all times, World 360 brings you some of the other mammoth rescue missions that have now made world history. Celebrations erupted at the Silkiara Tunnel in Uttarkashi when 41 labourers were pulled out safely after 17 long days. Despite a harrowing 400-hour ordeal, the labourers came out dazed, smiling and relieved. On the 12th of November, these workers were about to finish their shifts and celebrate Diwali with their families when tragedy struck. A section of the tunnel, about 200 metres from the entrance, collapsed and the 41 men got trapped. What followed was one of the greatest rescue operations the world has ever seen. There were many hurdles and setbacks, but the labourers and their rescuers never gave up hope. The grit and determination of the rescue teams ensured that each and every one of the labourers were evacuated from the tunnel with barely a scratch on them. While the Great Indian Tunnel Rescue will go down in the history books, there are many other rescue missions that are just as nerve-wracking. The most talked about rescue mission in recent years involves a Thai youth soccer team and their coach getting trapped in the Tham Luang cave. On the 23rd of June 2018, 12 members of the Wild Boar soccer team and their coach were exploring the cave complex in northern Thailand when heavy rains flooded the tunnels, trapping all of them. As the water levels inside the cave continued to rise, the boys who were aged between 11 and 16 years and their coach were struggling to survive. A mammoth rescue mission was launched involving more than 10,000 people, including 90 divers from different countries. A former Thai Navy SEAL died during the operation. But finally, after 18 days, two British divers located the boys and their coach and pulled them out to safety. On the 5th of August 2010, 33 Chilean workers were trapped after the collapse of the San Jose Gold and Copper Mine. After the collapse, the men moved to an underground emergency shelter area, 2,000 feet below surface, with limited food and water supply. Weeks later, rescuers were able to drill a small hole from the surface down to the miners, through which food, water and medicines could be sent to them. Finally, after 69 days, the miners, all aged between 19 to 63 years, escaped the tunnel one by one, via a capsule painted in the colours of Chile's national flag. <laughs> Another rescue mission that captured the imagination of India involved a five-year-old boy named Prince. In 2006, Prince fell into a 60-foot bore well in his village in Haryana's Kurukshetra district. For the next 50 hours, the nation waited with bated breath as the Indian Army came to his rescue. Another empty bore well of the same depth was found nearby and eventually, iron pipes with a diameter of 3 feet were used to connect the two bore wells, following which the child was pulled out safely. Visuals of 5-year-old Prince wrapped in a white sheet will always remain fresh in people's memory. Also, the United States has charged an Indian national with a conspiracy to murder banned Sikhs for justice head Gurpat Pan Singh Pannu. 
who is a U.S. citizen and has also been designated a terrorist by the Indian government. The U.S. Attorney's Office has said that Nikhil Gupta was arrested by Czech authorities in June and is now awaiting extradition. On the other hand, India has constituted a high-level inquiry committee to look into all the relevant aspects of this entire matter. Intel sources have revealed that India shared evidence against Panu with US seeking more cooperation and has also questioned the United States on its silence over Panu's threats to the Indian government. CNN News 18 Sanjay Suri brings you this report. Nikhil Gupta is currently awaiting extradition from the Czech Republic to the US where he is due then to be charged with the offences as listed in the indictment and he will face a very public trial and a great deal more information is likely to surface through the course of the trial and through those hearings that could prove very difficult for the Indian government particularly in relation to the alleged correspondence with the Indian government official who is said to have directed him and the indictment says US officials have copies of the encrypted conversations between the two in relation to the plan to carry out that murder and that assassination. Well, so not so encrypted uh, to begin with. Again, as alleged, this seems to have been a particularly clumsy plot. The indictment says that uh, Nikhil Gupta engaged someone as a hitman who then turned out to be an undercover US agent. So he seems to have walked straight into a trap without looking backwards or sidewards. The US indictment also now points worryingly to potential links, at least with the killing of Niger in Canada on June the 18th. Nikhil Gupta is alleged to have referred to that killing of Niger in his correspondence as a job well done with more to come. And uh, this appears then to have been the source of at least some of the intelligence and information from the US that led Trudeau to make his claims against India in the Canadian parliament. But despite these pointers, any evidence, uh, firm evidence that could be presented in court of the Indian government involvement in the killing of Niger is still weak. So really no clear, no firm evidence of that, at least not so far as known publicly yet. The Indian government has announced an inquiry. We do not know who is conducting such an inquiry, its terms of reference, the time frame, whether any outcome would be publicly shared. But clearly the road ahead is going to be a hard one for India, which would then now face uh, demands through the trial for extradition of the Indian government official and any further uh, evidence dug out in the Niger case uh, that may point to the involvement of Indian agencies could make all this yet more serious.